So welcome to EdTech Revisited uh, post-pandemic uh, constellations. Um, and thank you for uh, making time during the lunch break for this uh, round table, uh, which is actually part of a series. Um, yesterday we had one on uh, political expectations from different stakeholders with respect to education more broadly, but also the, the digital sort of uh, drive uh, uh, today. Um, tomorrow there will be um, a roundtable on uh, inclusion and uh, on Thursday on well-being. Uh, uh, same time, same place. Not same language though, they'll be in French I think mostly and today it will be mostly English. Um, I hope that's fine with you but since you're here I suppose it is. Um, I'm delighted to have with me uh, my three participants to the roundtable today. Uh, uh, Paolo Landri, senior researcher from CNR in Italy. Cristina Riesen, educational entrepreneur uh, traveling between Zurich and Brussels, among other destinations. Tobias Röhl, a professor at the Zurich University of uh, Teacher Education. Um, unfortunately, um, Margarida Romero uh, from University of Nice had to cancel her participation to this uh, round table and panel, but I'll bring in some of our thoughts, I, I hope at least uh, uh, during our conversation um, for the next hour or so. So uh, what I suggest is that I start off with a round of presentations of, uh, of uh, the participants to the panel and then the idea was to delve into uh, their respective expertise in terms of how they have been involved in uh, digital technology, uh, be it in their research, but also in terms of innovation, social or technical. Um, let's start off with uh, Dr. Paolo Landri, um, uh, who is a renowned sociologist of education and senior researcher at the Institute uh, of Research on Population and uh, Social Policies at the National Research Council in Italy, the CNR, Centro Nazionale di Ricerca. Ecco, Consiglio. Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca, okay. Um, uh, based in Fisciano, which is a, a part of the University of uh, Salerno, uh, close to uh, Naples. Um, Paolo Landri's research uh, bears on educational organizations, professional learning, and educational policies, also from a comparative uh, perspective. So recent research has been uh, on the development of uh, digital governance of education in Italy, but also in other European countries in comparative perspective. Um, as part of that interest, also uh, a focus on platformization and datafication of education. Um, he has published widely on these topics more recently, but also before on uh, uh, social material aspects of education. I, I put on the book uh, sleeves of two recent ones, Digital Governance of Education and Educational um, Leadership, respectively published uh, at Bloomberg and Routledge. And uh, what is important also maybe for the researchers in the room to know, he's the co-editor-in-chief of the EERJ, which is the European Educational Research Journal. So uh, if you want to submit something soon, that'd be a good address. <laughs> So, with that, I would like to move on to Christina Riesen. Uh, she is the founder and uh, CEO of Educurators, Educurators Foundation, foundation based in Zurich and also board member of the European Innovation Council uh, in Brussels uh, as part of the European Commission. Uh, Christina is an educational entrepreneur with 20 years or so of experience in the fields of innovation, communication, emerging technologies and education, of course. Uh, in more recent years, she uh, was a general manager uh, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Evernote, uh, which is sort of software to take uh, uh, digital notes, create them, and so forth. She managed also the launch of the Swiss EdTech Collider at EPFL, right next door, has been uh, involved in and collaborating with the strategic development team at ETH Zurich. And uh, in 2017, she founded, notably, uh, Educreators Foundation as an impact network uh, with more of 50,000 teachers or so reached through their 
various activities. That's the figure I struck out to me mostly, but I have others in my notes. Um, and she is also on the steering board uh, of an initiative uh, called uh, Digi Edu Hack. Um, I, I won't go into <laughs> details for now, but maybe if Christina wishes to do so in a moment, uh, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, next to me is um, uh, Professor Dr. Tobias Röhl, newly appointed at the uh, Zurich University of Teacher Education uh, in January uh, uh, 2021. Um, before that, he was a, was a appreciated and much distinguished postdoctoral researcher, also at the Special Collaborative Research Center uh, on Media of Cooperation at the University of Siegen in Germany. Um, but now as a professor uh, in uh, digital learning and teaching, he's also part of uh, the research groups or the Research Center for Education and Digital Transformation on the one hand, uh, and another center for media education and computer science on the other, both at the uh, PH Zürich, at the Zurich University of Teacher Education. Um, he was also recently involved in, and, and we get to the panel discussion shortly. Uh, he was also recently involved in uh, an expert group uh, from the European Commission on Artificial Intelligence and Data in Training and Education um, uh, with the task and mission to develop ethical guidelines for the responsible use of uh, AI and data in education. Among his publications also I flagged two books again. Uh, one goes back to his dissertation 2013, I think, Dinge des Wissens, Things of Knowing, say, Schulunterricht als materielle Praxis, uh, uh, teaching or, 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 and learning as material practice in Lucius and Lucius Verlag, uh, 2013. More recently, he has also published on uh, Verteilte Zurechenbarkeit, uh, uh, Distributed Accountability, with an interesting field study actually, not on the Swiss school system, but Swiss railway system, um, and on how breakdowns are dealt with and so forth. But always with an interest in technology, and maybe I can flag a, 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 an article also that I noticed uh, in his uh, rich set of uh, interconnected publications, titled, The Meaning of Things, Didactic Objects, and the Implementation of Educational Theory, which is a uh, which appeared in 2019 in Pedagogy, Culture and Society with Herbert Kalthoff and, and colleagues. So the meaning of things. So what are the things we're gonna talk about now? Um, I asked actually my um, distinguished panelists, if you will, um, to reflect upon what they've been doing in the field of digital education, digital technology, uh, what they've learned from that involvement, and also uh, how the COVID pandemic situation factored into uh, their learning experience, but as experts in their respective areas. And uh, what might be next? So what I suggest is that I, I give you, each of you, like 10 minutes or so to, to, to get to these questions. And I thought maybe we could start off with uh, Paolo Landri, and his experience uh, uh, regarding, and I just read out the questions again. What is your recent research and or current involvement with EdTech, digital education technology? What have you learned from your research slash involvement during the COVID-19 pandemic? And thirdly, what are the next steps in your continuing engagement with post-COVID in brackets at tech? These are quite broad questions, but I thought it might be worthwhile to hear from you who are practically involved in these things to maybe, uh, uh, you know, accept these questions as an invitation to elaborate on your respective experience and expertise. So, Paolo. It's okay? Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, Philippe and uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be, glad to be here to discuss with those these uh, important things uh, for the presentation of my work. You know, coming back, you know, to your question, the first question, what is my involvement in research on the fields? You have 
already reminded me this book. <laughs> Thank you. And it was on the digital governance of education. It appeared uh, before the COVID-19. So it was something, uh, you know, unexpected, of course, for all of us. But uh, even for me that I started to, to work on this topic before so long, you know, that, you know, what was uh, first something that was innovative and uh, apparently, you know, before the COVID-19, something uh, far away from the practice of school, then with the emergency, it became full operational uh, in many, many countries. I couldn't say anywhere, because I will come back to that, because, you know, in the emergency situation, there was a different response in different countries as to the way to deal with the, the lockdown, you know, and so far, and the, the situation of emergency. So, first of all, there was, of course, some research that I did before, and then my interest for, uh, was mainly to understand these processes and the overall trends of the what I call like uh, the standardization of education. So the idea was to relate the digitalization to this overall trend that is can be related back to the modernization of the educational systems. You know, basically that was the first uh, step on my uh, on my research. Then it became something different because you know with the emergency the situation changed a lot, and then. Uh, we have done with Sotiria Grec, which is uh, the other co-editor of ERJ, a double special, issues, or double special issue on this journal during the lockdown. It was an interesting experience because when we, st we, we launched this call for a paper, and it was uh, exactly during the pandemic, we attracted a lot of uh, proposals from many, many uh, colleagues, and that was also a sign of vitality of the educational researcher. And then for us it was very difficult to select, you know, the most appropriate, you know, uh, papers uh, to publish. But, you know, this uh, double special issue um, uh, gives you a, s a sort of map of what's happened, you know, especially during the first steps of the lockdown. And, and then, of course, we have also developed uh, in Italy with several colleagues uh, like Emiliano Grimaldi and also Danilo Taglietti a sort of uh, what we have called uh, uh, public sociology of, uh, of uh, digital schooling we, because we were really committed, you know, in helping schools, you know, in, in these moments of difficulties. And so for us it was also a challenge as a researcher, not just to study but also to help school you know, in this uh, situation. And then, of course, we did it in a critical way because we were very aware of the complexity, you know, this, uh, not because we were, uh, we are against, you know, technologies, and, and I will come back also to this because I think it's a crucial point, but just to help, you know, because there, there was, a, there is, well, there was, it's difficult to say, you know, an emergency, and, and then, you know, there was this commitment to help you know, and to, uh, in a way, to help uh, people to, to deal with that. What I have learned, so to come in back, you know, to second question from this uh, experience, from the knowledge that we have accumulated uh, during this time. First of all, we have seen clearly an acceleration of the digital. That was uh, clearly an acceleration. That was part probably of the modernization process, you know, the idea of the te technology as the solution to deal with an emergency. And it was also related, of course, with a, a situation that we have called uh, in this double, in the, the introduction to these uh, special issues, Sotiria Grec and I, you know, with the idea of the state of education emergency. You know, that was a time when, you know, this transnational governance uh, of education was put on hold at least temporarily. <laughs> and of course, governments of uh, the countries of the world had this very critical decision to take, you know, how to deal with the emergency. Should we leave the schools closed down for all the time, or should we provide something that can be, uh, you know, a solution, even in the emergency, to these problems? Of course, as you have reminded you, I'm coming from a country where the lockdown was very severe, 
and they're really long, so it was very complicated situation. So, but, so there was a swift passage to the digital technologies. That was a surprise for a country that if you go to the class, you know, to the list of the, of the countries as to the digital technologies, not in a very, you know, priority top uh, uh, countries. And that was very interesting, at least for us as a researcher, to understand why that was this uh, uh, quick, you know, uh, alignment, you know, to the digitals. And what we have seen is that, of course, that was really prepared well before, in a way, so that because, you know, especially this big tech, you know, big company were prepare, you know, this, uh, this passage. And so, in a way, you know, the digital was presenting, presented sorry, as the only way, you know, to guarantee a sort of continuity of the school. That I'm, I'm talking about Italy, you know, as a special case, but we have seen, you know, similar trends also in other countries all over the, all over the Europe. And so that, that it was presented as the only way to guarantee, you know, a sort of continuity of the school. And uh, for example, in Italy, we had this uh, strange term with an acronym, incredible, completely it was DAD. <laughs> it means uh, emergence, no, it was, there is not the term uh, uh, emergency, but it was didactic at distance. It means uh, uh, Didactic, you know, exactly, at a distance. It means that you can do uh, the same lesson by using platforms, you know, educational platform. And then there was a, a, a pressure, a shift. There was a big initiative called, uh, solid, uh, you know, Solidarity, you know, that was the label. It was, and we have seen similar response in many, many countries. Uh, in Sweden, for example, there was some problems, you know, in Germany. It was not so straightforward as it was uh, in, uh, in Italy. In France, they had a different uh, mixed, uh, you know, situation because in France they had in the past a platform that was owned by the state. You know, we, ha we have a different uh, situation. So we have an acceleration, but, you know, uh, the answers from many countries was completely different. And as I told you, the difference was also because we are uh, talking about, you know, countries from the global north, because in other countries, in the global south, for example, you know, the solutions were varied. For example, in some cases, they just used the radio, you know, on the old media, like the, the, the television, you know, that was interesting because it reminds ourselves, you know, that the question of the educational technologies was not just a matter of the present, but it was very old, you know, question because it, it, was, it is back in the history of the, of the education, of course, and also of the, of the technology. So we have seen that acceleration. Uh, it was this acceleration that it was... Uh, pushed by the, this state of educational emergency. So there was a change in the global governance of education. The attention was not anymore on the testing, you know, the global governance on the testing. And then there was a, a shift of the direction of the governance towards the digitals. That was a critical passage, in my view. And of course, what was the effects of this? In retrospect, we can say that we are seeing, you know, uh, an acceleration of the soft privatization of, of schooling in the sense that uh, that was a sort of embodiment. I, I would probably uh, force probably the interpretation by saying incorporation. But, you know, what happened was that, you know, the major companies like Google, you know, and uh, Microsoft Teams, if you look at the picture, is very impressive, you know the number of, uh, uh, it became basically the infrastructure of the public schooling in several. In Italy, for example, Google Italia was very uh, keen to demonstrate how <laughs> Italy was a case of successful, you know, uh, a solution to the question of that was really advertised also by the ministry, the minister, 
our former Ministry of Education that presented, you know, this contact with Google as very relevant. So it was striking, at least, you know, for a researcher to see these uh, close relationships with a, a big a, a tech company, not even a European, Italian, but even a European, you know, a big a, a tech. The same happened also with the Microsoft. In many, many cases in Italy, there has been a huge uh, relationship, uh, many, many higher education systems and university as a close relationship. Of course, this was done at least apparently for free. <laughs> but you, we know very well that these are companies, so there is also an interest, clearly an interest, because they become very important uh, uh, in the basic infrastructure. Of and of course, there is, you know, maybe we can talk after yeah. that about, you know, platform edification, so far, so, so that's what. So we have this different rate of acceleration so in, in many, many uh, count, countries. And of course, what we have also observed in terms of the changing morphologies of the schooling. And we have some forms of the, what I, we have called as a pure digital schools. That means the, that just a, a substitution of the school with a platform at a distance, basically using uh, the uh, a platform or, uh, you know, uh, like video conferencing, you know, as a, as a tool. And then we have also some forms, as far as the emergency were, you know, put aside, then with the reopening of the school, some forms of blended forms yeah, of yeah. schooling. So that was interesting. Yeah. Maybe I can stop yeah, uh, yeah. for a... Well, thank you very much for this sort of first panorama almost of, of how uh, educational technology became involved in how the COVID pandemic was dealt with. Um, now, I, I turn my uh, look to um, uh, Christina uh, Riesen and um, again, for you, sort of the same kinds of questions and how, 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 how does, I mean, how have you been involved in uh, 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 with educational technology what, what has COVID-19 changed to that and, and, and what might be, be next uh, from your perspective as a more an educational entrepreneur also and uh, working with different kinds of educational technology also, this was something that I was the most struck with, but thank you. First of all, hello everyone. It's great to be here and to see you. Thanks a lot for taking time. And as Philippe mentioned in the beginning, I wear different hats. So I will try to go one after the other. Uh, so first of all, as a board member of the European Innovation Council, I am super excited to see that there's a strong will on the political European level to make innovation happen. A new European innovation agenda has been recently published and there's a lot going on. So it makes me very happy as an entrepreneur to know that we are taking steps to truly foster innovation. And when we say that, it's about being mindful when it comes to also developing education te technologies that we can bring in our European DNA, our values. And these are related to ethics. These are related to research-driven, research-informed. And I think this is where Europe has the potential to become a global leader in deep tech and also ed tech. And we should do everything we can and work together in order to do there because the time is now. Now we are shaping on the global level the technologies that w will be used um, in the future. And this is, I would say, our strongest contribution here in Switzerland and in Europe because we have amazing universities, amazing research centers. And also, we care about a learner-centric approach. We care about um, human values. So on that, on that level, I would say, just to wrap up, because I saw some exciting posters out there, if you have an interesting research idea or you are involved in a research project, Deep Tech, linked to education or beyond, please, by all means, um, do go and check the European Innovation Council website because um, we are set to become the largest 
deep tech fund in Europe, and we are actively supporting research teams and innovators from idea to scale up. So um, reach out in case um, you would like to learn more, and I'm happy to connect you with people. So I would say um, it is important to continue um, collaborating um, with researchers, politicians, entrepreneurs in order to shape actively this agenda of education innovation going forward. Then from the EdTech community perspective, because as you mentioned, I was privileged enough to um, launch the Swiss EdTech Collider at EBFL. Meanwhile, it uh, grew and is very well established. It has a vibrant community of uh, entrepreneurs. And I would say there, here in Switzerland, we are also setting an example because the Collider is anchored and very closely linked not only to EPFL, so when we are talking about really cutting edge emerging tech and ETH, but also learning sciences. Because um, one of the things that um, the EdTech community, EdTech developers um, should embrace or be mindful about is that in order for whatever tools, whatever um, platforms, um, digital platforms, digital tools uh, are developed, in order for them to truly have an impact, they should be anchored in strong pedagogical frameworks. And they can be innovative pedagogies, um, and they should be informed by learning sciences, on one hand, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, right? And then also because I think um, there's a data-driven approach that can support the development of technologies leading to tangible learning outcomes. And I think this is a huge topic for the EdTech community in general, right? So, um, and again, I would like to really highlight the Collider as being a pioneer and as, as an example on how to move forward with this, working with research and also um, with communities of teachers this year, um, there's an exciting initiative um, in the works where there's going to be also test beds. So really this idea of involving all stakeholders in the development and then also the scale up of uh, certain products. So for the edtech community, the challenges are multiple. It's on one hand, um, you know, having this right collaborative environment, I think is key. Then of course it's regulation. So especially when we look at emerging technologies and the use of machine learning and so on, especially with maybe innovative pedagogical approaches, it is not easy. How do we do it? How do we handle data? What do we do about it? So um, this is huge work in front of us, but unless we do it, um, we can expect that to come from other places <laughs> in the world. So I would say this is also where we can add value. And then for entrepreneurs in the edtech world, you know, just like any startup out there is funding. And this is really challenging because investors and investment firms, of course, uh, would prefer to go for safe bets. And it is very difficult to make the case for a viable, uh, profitable business when you're building something that challenges so many different uh, frameworks we have. And um, it's been actually a good development. So um, the investment in EdTech before pandemic um, was rising spectacularly, which was very encouraging to see. Now, of course, with the uh, current um, economical situation, it's kind of uh, slowing down. So I would say there as well, it is not to underestimate the importance of funding and um, you know funding those bold ideas that also need time to develop in order to have solid solutions going forward and um, with the fund at the European Innovation Council I think this is where it makes a difference because it's a patient investor you know when you bet on an idea that is breakthrough that is really out of the box you cannot expect, like, you, you need to let it grow, you need to allow it to develop, to, to um, allow time. You cannot work under pressure to deliver uh, revenue or active users as investors usually uh, look at things, right? So 
there, there's really also a need, um, definitely a need to invest uh, and support teams who may need a bit more time in order to develop uh, viable edtech products. So when we look at edtech and the pandemic, um, of course the innovators would have loved to see much more being done and everybody was hoping that, okay, now with this kind of situation, there's gonna be an increased appetite for trying, for exploring. Um, it is fair enough that this is not possible because again, you know, when you look at the situation of teachers also in the classroom, um, they went through a tough uh, situation and there's a lot of noise out there, you know, so many people are trying to approach everybody with all sorts of ideas and solutions. So it's not easy to make sense. So I would say this is where um, if you have here, for example, the collider um, that we have now in Switzerland and um, you build those bridges between research, the classroom, also the political level, long term this can lead to sustainable um, solutions that are learner centric and also benefit everybody. So I am excited to see that it's definitely going in that direction, maybe not so fast as we would have hoped. However, the trend is definitely there. And then um, my third hat uh, for educreators. So educreators is all about, okay, how do we make innovation happen, right? So how do we do it in the end? And there, uh, it's really all about um, co-creation and strategic partnerships. And I'm super excited uh, that I saw also outside one of our strategic partners, Roteco, and we also um, you know, collaborate closely with EPFL Learn and, and ETH and other uh, universities and uh, um, education institutions. And there, the question is, okay, how do we do it? You know, like how do we bring more innovation into the classroom? How do we um, enable certain mindsets? How do we demystify uh, digital, um, maybe not necessarily tools, but more like, you know, um, the whole digitalization. And I would only mention uh, one of the flagship initiatives, which is uh, Project Square. And it is focusing on this idea of taking computational thinking as a transversal skill in the setting of a human smart city and then co-creating so it's research informed, it's developed, co-developed with researchers and then also um, with the teachers going forward, you know, so having a base that allows people to start um, co-creating and, and developing together a new um, pedagogical materials, for example, for the classroom. Um, so Project Square was um, also coming in with the idea of unplugged, you know, so going back to this digital literacy almost, you know, like how do we ensure that we demystify for the teachers, but also for the students, and especially when we look at, um, you know, empowering women to become engineers uh, later on. It is incredibly important to show that anybody can understand what an algorithm is and also, you know, um, basic, basic uh, computer science concepts, you can really, um, in, a, in an embodied way, experience them. And also show that this is not done for, um, you know, the, the goal of learning concepts, that you can actually use them in order to develop solutions to a challenge that your community has when it comes to infrastructure. So we try to bring a lot of things into Project Square and it requires a huge collective effort. And um, I would say for me, this is what I hope to be the future of education. You know, so this really close uh, interdisciplinary collaboration and enabling. I, I will definitely take a look at the closer look at the project again. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, on Roteco, and we have also here, uh, and also outside, you can talk to the community. Um, there's uh, many different projects and activities where the goal is exactly that, you know, like the mystifying, bringing people closely to um, what may seem something almost um, impossible to, to do or to understand. 
And I think this is important because we have a lot of human potential and the education in whatever form we will create it should actually in the end contribute to allowing everyone to fulfill their potential and also to develop together a society in which um, hopefully we can thrive. So I'm a bit of a dreamer in case you didn't <laughs> notice and an idealist but um, I am on the optimistic side not saying that you know uh, it's like everything changed from one day to the other I'm just saying there's change, we are getting there, we are in transition, and um, it's all about the future we would like to proactively shape. Okay, I think that's a really nice uh, closing to your first round. So thank you very much, Christina. Reason, um, um, now, I'll, I'll turn my gaze or my look to um, Tobias Röhl. Uh, professor in uh, digital learning and teaching at uh, Zurich University uh, of Teacher Education. So, what has been your involvement with uh, educational technology um, over the years, and perhaps more recently with respect to the COVID <clears throat> pandemic, and, and where does it lead to? I think I can take up the notion of demystification that Christina raised um, because um, ultimately my research also does a similar thing to when it comes to technologies in the classroom um, because I'm always looking at, at technologies in the classroom whether digital or non-digital um, with, the, with the idea um, that we have to understand how they are built in order to understand also how they are used. So I'm always combining these two perspectives. On the one hand, coming from science and technology studies, um, looking at the development, the actual processes of developing um, these kind of tools and media. Um, and on the other hand, looking at, um, coming from edu educational ethnography, looking at how are these tools actually used in the classroom. So I combine these two perspectives. On the one hand, um, because I'm interested how, how something like digital transformation works, um, not as something that is like, a, like an extreme process where you have on the one hand big ed tech and on the, on the other hand small tiny classrooms that are somehow um, subjugated but understand it as a process where um, many different actors are involved, also smaller ed tech companies and, and institutions and things like that, and also the processes in between these ed tech companies and the classroom. How do these ideas travel? And you also mentioned in the beginning um, the article, The Meaning of Things, which is exactly about the idea that um, we need to understand um, the implicit often implicit assumptions that ed tech companies have about education, about learning, about teaching, about students and teachers that they in a way implement in their tools often without thinking about it and uh, what are the, 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 the consequences of that in the classroom. And, uh, sometimes you, you get um, a, a rhetoric of revolution, of disruption with, with uh, many uh, ed tech companies um, but um, we researched one particular uh, smaller company um, and found out that um, they were really like talking in their marketing about um, dis revolutionizing education and bringing about a new form of teaching. But when we looked at the, uh, when, when we were with them in, the work, in their workshops, they were uh, taking a quite um, traditional model of teaching and transforming that into their tools which didn't work um, with the pilot schools they had the, the schools they worked closely together with and so they had to adapt their own tools um, in order to uh, that modern teaching could work with these tools because they had this somehow naive assumption um, that they know how teaching works and, and just used the old model that they probably experienced themselves in their school uh, biography um, so um, that's one thing, um, looking at, at both um, the, the actual development and the implicit meanings coming into these tools and how these ideas travel and, and enter the classrooms. Um, another project we did, or uh, I did with uh, Michel Geis from the Zurich University of Teacher Education uh, was looking at um, another intermediary actor uh, in this process, the so-called PICTS, uh, those of you who, who um, are familiar with the um, 
Swiss German Volksschule, know what picked up, pedagogical ICT support, people that are um, responsible of their schools, teachers themselves that are responsible for um, showing their colleagues how to use um, digital media in this classroom in a meaningful, pedagogically sound way. And they're important um, intermediaries in this process of bringing about um, yeah, the digital transformation of the classroom. But they are often overlooked because um, you often see like these big names of ad tech companies like Apple and Microsoft and so on, but you forget about these tiny actors or smaller actors in between, which often um, have a very important role in this whole process. And that's uh, what I find really interesting when, when we talk about ad tech and um, its role for, for education. Um, another thing I'm also interested in is um, artificial intelligence. You mentioned it in the beginning. And there I'm interested in, in the transformation of the role of, of the profession of, te of teachers. What new competences do they need if they really want to use um, artificial intelligence systems in their school, automated gradings and, uh, grading and things like this? And also, um, uh, you mentioned distributed accountability. What does it mean um, for accountability relations? What happens uh, when the automatic grading system um, gives you a bad grade, a student's essay? And uh, who, who is to be uh, held accountable for that? Is it the teacher who introduced the tool, or the school, the, the, the principal, or is it the company? Um, if some, somebody says, well, um, this, this grade I received is not just, whom do you hold accountable for that? So uh, something changes there, which I find really interesting as coming from, from a sociology of technology uh, perspective also. And um, you also mentioned it, um, one last project I, I want to mention is um, the expert group um, of the European Commission um, on AI and uh, data and education, where we uh, develop this guideline of um, using AI and data responsibly in, in education, which also follows this European idea that you mentioned um, that um, the European Commission really sees that as an asset and not as a like a hindrance to innovation, because that's something that we probably um, yeah, that's our advantage, um, can, can be advantage in the market if you compare it to the Chinese market, for example, where they probably don't have the same ethical values or, or concerns um, when they develop uh, AI for education. And that can, I mean, I hope so that uh, European, the European education system sees that as a, as a plus if, if AI, for example, is developed in, in, in the European uh, context that it's somehow more uh, ethically sound. And, um, but the guideline is more aimed at teachers, just to say that briefly. Um, it gives teachers questions that they can ask uh, about um, the, their use of AI and, and data to find out whether they want to use it or not and when to use it and how to use it. So for example, questions of um, algorithmic bias is an important topic. Does um, are the data sets that the AI is trained on, um, are they, um, could there be the danger that they bias certain groups of, of the population um, based on their race, ethnicity, sex, gender, et cetera? Um, yeah, and um, the question about the pandemic, um, I also thought about that. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's a chance, uh, I agree with you too also, but um, for me, it's also a chance to, to rethink um, the role of technology in education and what it means to teach face-to-face -face or in, in distance learning or with different media. And of course, the old classroom without digital media is also full of technology, uh, like chairs in the broadest sense, like chairs and the blackboard and so on. Um, but the pandemic for me is also, people notice that, uh, teachers and students notice that um, not everything works um, the same if you, you cannot just transfer um, the old classroom teaching to, to the new digital setting that doesn't work. And there's also some value uh, in meeting face to face and um, we can find out what, what the value of, of meeting face to face is and, and think about this anew. And why do we meet in a classroom uh, each morning? And what's the purpose of that? that? That's also something we can now, I think, more, more visibly think about. Yeah, and, and truly, well, hopefully, appreciate. Um, so thanks for being here also face to face. And thank you for your, 
first uh, sort of uh, glimpses at what you've been involved in, and uh, I think it was an interesting uh, uh, tableau of different positions and, and different work. So um, I, I think I, I will give you the opportunity as planned sort of maybe to react on what some of your colleagues just said before opening up the conversation more broadly since we're still within time, so uh, that's good. Um, and I do it simply, maybe starting with Paolo again, and then um, Christina and, and Tobias, and then maybe I'll have something to add as a Lausanne sociologist uh, before opening the discussion, but Paolo, maybe. First of all, I can say that we are in the, probably in the third of your questions, you know, that by, what, what are the next steps, you know, about, about this? And I'm trying to react also to, to your very interesting contribution to these roundtables. Now, first of all, I think that what we need now, you know, we, ha we had these accelerations, you know, of the digital that was uh, partly of this uh, emergency situation. Now, but this is also my feeling, there is a need to probably slow down, not in the sense that it is fine, you know, no fundings. It's, it's all, it's uh, positive, you know, in a way, this, this change. You know, rethinking about what you have said, you know, through the pandemic, we are now able to rethink about, you know, the schooling of education as an institution, you know. You know, this is, I think, critical, you know, in dealing with uh, the future that, it is we are we have to imagine you know there is a problem of an institution to rethink and i am very much you know committed in in this kind of uh, discourse so in order to do that i think that we need a, a sort of uh, cultural work you know in the sense that in my view a, a very important point is to overcoming this dualism between the technology and education it seems that there is not the sense there is still this idea that authentic education is the, is only you know human to humans, which is uh, in my view it's a sort of uh, an imaginary dream because even uh, in the in the past you know there was a mediation of a space, of a materiality, of a desk, of a, you know of a seats and so far and so on. Everything you know is mediated. <coughs> so it, so it, it was a. A sort of uh, need, you know, to reconsider, you know, so also theoretically, and, and of course we have a tradition of to collect many, many resources to uh, to uh, to do that. To do that, we can do it in a different way because now we have also the intellectual resources to do it, but also practically several means to do it. I I also uh, am impressed, you know, by. You know, the point that you have made about the presence of many, many little ed tech, uh, you know, probably there is a need to give more space, you know, uh, with respect to this big, you know, ed tech industry that are not European at all, you know. So, yeah, that's a good reminder. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's important, you know, because... Uh, in a way, we should remind that uh, there is a need to to devise, you know, in a different way, those tools that was formerly produced just for a business uh, uh, goals, and it's fine, okay. But now there is a need to, in a way, to think in a different way, you know. The Maybe um, uh, Christina, if you could uh, respond or react or to what uh, colleagues have. I cannot agree more with Paolo, except, of course, for slowing down too much on <laughs> some of uh, these aspects. But it would be wonderful if we could move beyond even using the term digital education, right? And moving more and more using what should be teaching and learning be all about in the world we live in, with the challenges we have, with the people we have, what would make sense and also prioritize it um, funding wise of course political wise because if uh, budgets for education are cut um, you know it's not like our society will be able to thrive in the future so we need to be mindful about all these things and I would strongly believe that the quality of a society will be dictated by the quality of teaching and learning and 
I see almost this window of opportunity we have right now with the pandemic acting almost as a trigger to prompt some questions for us to ask. And now, fully agree with you, we should take the time to actually understand, you know, ask the core questions, because it is not about which tool shall I use in my classroom today, like which quiz, uh, you know, shall I do with my students. It is much more, it goes deeper, and this is where, especially with the brilliant researchers we have, you know, there's a lot to be said. So we need to empower them, to give them more share of voice publicly, and um, really, you know, insist that, you know, the time is now and there are things that can be done. Um, first of all, um, politically speaking, in Switzerland, you know, um, the system, sometimes it is our blessing and our curse uh, because of education being so uh, cantonally anchored and being sometimes also subject to the not invented here syndrome, right? So. Perhaps this is an invitation for us, and um, thank you for also making space, you know, and opening up and bringing, I think, this kind of setting, because this is what we need to do. And out of that, um, we will be able uh, to understand what makes sense and understand um, that you know, em emerging technologies or ed tech, um, they are only, a, um, you know, an, an enabler if we see them like an enabler, but um, they will not be able to answer the hard questions for us. And it has been seen also, you know, in the development of tech. Um, depending on the engineering team who's developing a certain product, you will end up having a certain user experience or seeing certain things. So um, we, we can do something about it here. So for the next steps, um, if I would have a plea, it would be first of all on the political level, especially on the cantonal uh, level, for um, the authorities to come and engage with the existing communities of innovators, uh, with the PEHAs, to really understand what it means to do education innovation so that they can enable it, so that we can move faster. Then um, investment for innovators. We need to empower these people to keep on creating and do their work. And um, elevate, again, the, the, the need for being research-informed and research-driven and working with learning sciences, because this is one of the fundamental pillar, independently of whatever emerging technology will be there, that uh, we should not oversee. This should be central. And I think there's much more to talk about and, and it's to, make, to create awareness around this um, right now. I mean, in organizing these panels and so forth, we always say, well, one hour is quite short to have these big questions discussed. But thank you very much for also your sort of um, input uh, and plea for a, a more a sort of proactive innovation stance in, in public education systems, if I may put it that way. And I'm not saying that I'm agreeing with it. I'm not saying that I'm disagreeing with it, but I pass the floor to Tobias, um, maybe from his perspective and also listening to your colleagues, mm. what, could, what would you add? Mm. Yeah, I, I have a question for, for one of my colleagues, if that's okay as well. Yes, of course. Christina, um, what would you say to people that say, well, of course you're a proponent of digital transformation of education, you're invested yourself as, as, as an ed tech developer also. Um, what would you say to people that say, well, isn't that some kind of technological solution? Isn't? Aren't you trying to solve pedagogical problems solely with technology? I'm playing Advocatus Diaboli here, obviously, but I'm interested in this. Yeah, it is one of the main critics to EdTech and to the EdTech community. And I would say this is where it is on um, the EdTech entrepreneurs to prove 
and there are emerging best practice and um, a few of them that are definitely making a difference and to show that um, you know it is not technology for technology's sake right and um, especially when we look at now let's say everything that would go in the direction of personalized learning it's such a massive big hairy <laughs> challenge to solve technologically speaking but also pedagogically ethically right now right so i would say that there um you know it is really um capitalizing on um on these emerging best practices and and really proving that there is a more solid way to approach tech at tech development. So I think it is important to have critical voices always. And um, as long as we can accommodate and integrate, especially the voices of um, pedagogical experts and, and uh, learning sciences, we are on a good way. And I think this is where I must go back to um, the example we have here in Switzerland with the Collider. It is incredibly important strategically that it is anchored, you know, with ETH, um, with EPFL, and there is, uh, you know, the Learn Center and ETH Learning Sciences being actively involved. They, they've become very actively involved here in the cantonal education policy, uh, indeed. Um, which maybe brings me to questions from the audience or uh, um, reactions or opinions or whatever you want to, would like to voice potentially. We have one or two micros that circulate, I think, in the room. Yeah. Ah, okay. Or will be circulating. Ah, okay. Oh, there's somebody. No, it's better for the recording, actually. Thank you. Is it fine? Yeah. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I have two very practical questions for Christina. Uh, the first one, you mentioned test beds and the funding that's coming from EU. Um, I would like to know how it will be operational, operationalized through Horizon, because then my question is how Swiss can participate. Uh, and the second one regarding EDU creators, because I know um, your work through that. Um, how do you start your project? Because on the website, I'm completely clear which projects you have, but how do people approach you or you initiate projects only by people who are currently in the EDU creators? Thank you. Thank you very much for the two questions. Concerning um, Switzerland and Horizon, as we know, for the time being, it is what it is. We are on standby and keep our fingers crossed for a happy ending. You know, it's how it is. However, there are ways in which um, usually also in early stages, there's teams of researchers. Um, so it's also, you know, different uh, countries involved. So I would say depending a bit on the stage, it is also worth um, uh, discussing and, and, you know, kind of getting in touch with people to check what is possible. Knowing that, as you also may be aware, um, InnoSwiss also, uh, as, as a bridge, as a transition solution, has almost as a twin of the EIC in place to make sure that we are not uh, losing any of the great research projects um, and, and then we can make things happen. So there are ways and really we hope all of us <laughs> that uh, you know that somehow this situation will be solved because it is just um, right now such uh, uh, just uh, you know it doesn't make sense somehow so let's keep our fingers crossed that politicians will somehow figure it out and meanwhile on the very practical terms there are ways to get to funding so either again depending on the stage of the project and maybe participation with another universities or in you know, Swiss locally um, they also have uh, a solution in place right now and then for edu creators uh, thank you so much for pointing that out we are not a typical organization we are 
you could look at us, we are really an organic structure. You know, so it's not going to be um, um, directed by um, processes on how we approach and what we do. It is usually by um, just a natural coming together of uh, different communities, different people, and focusing on certain topics. And sometimes they fly and sometimes they die. You know, it's how it is. And um, we, uh, you know, um, and, and Educate is basically a network, you know, so it is not, um, we have employees or, it is very challenging, of course, to operate in such a way as well on many different levels, but it allows us to, I would say, accelerate uh, co-creation. And what we would like is to, our, our wish is that we can um, collaborate with the system, with the school system, you know. So our wish is to support, is never to compete or to diminish and it's complex because there's different dynamics involved, especially when you look at new topics, uh, you know, so something that has not been there before. But um, uh, also with Project Square, we've seen that it can work. And sometimes everything comes together beautifully and there's also, you know, the political support and then there's this and that and then somehow it can start, it can happen, and then you have to see where it goes, right? So then you have to also open it up and then see what happens and what people um, do with it. So it's, it's really this idea of, um, first of all, observing, understanding the very complex environment of education, especially when we look, let's say, at primary school level, right? And then um, coming in with many different views, so learning sciences, and then we have interactional design, so we have many different um, you know, point of views coming together and saying, okay, so if um, we start with the idea that computational thinking <laughs> is important as a transversal skill, and um, we would like to foster the maker mindset, you know, this idea that teachers can also create their own um, learning, teaching materials. How would we do that in practice? Okay. And uh, it's a long process. Yeah, yeah. How would we do that in practice? But I, I mean, I, I think that was sort of the idea of this um, symposium also to, to give practitioners and with their respective expertise, sort of an opportunity also to, to lay it out on the table. Um, we're already 20 minutes past or so. Maybe I'll just finish the session on a, on a sociological note. Uh, it's not my personal sociological note, but it's the one that Margarida Romero sort of communicated to me uh, since she wanted to start out with uh, her intervention with a, a survey that was made in different countries uh, from the UK, United States, but also in the global south, if you will, Brazil, uh, and like 10 countries or so, where young people were asked uh, what they think about the governments. And 65% uh, of them apparently think that the governments rob them of their future and connected obviously to climate change and other a uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, crisis we're going through, or the planet is going through. And then with respect to digital technology or education, etc., presumably it's, it's about charting a course between creative uses, as Margarita also elaborates them, or as you have done, but also probably a, a certain digital minimalism. Um, I'm not, you know, as a sociologist interested in tensions, I'm happy that you came here to explore them with us and also with our panelists. And I would like to thank Paolo Landry, Christina Riesen, and Tobias Rowe once more, and you for being here. And hope you'll enjoy the conference <laughs> for the rest of the week. Cheers.